The little train was carrying all those wonderful things to the good little boys and girls on the other side of the mountain. She puffed along merrily. Then all of a sudden, she stopped with a jerk. She simply could not go another inch. She tried and she tried, but her wheels would not turn. What are all those good little boys and girls on the other side of the mountain going to do without the wonderful toys to play with and the good food to eat? Here comes a shiny new engine, said the funny little clown who jumped out of the train. Let us ask him to help us. So all the dolls and toys cried out together. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Okay. That's, yeah, that just kind of... All right. Yeah. That's a great little book, ain't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, now that's... That's the first book that the kids get. Why that book? Well, because that little book was the, one of the first things that ever really touched me. And I think that there's a great message in it and why it's lasted so long is that you can do whatever you believe that you can do. It's like through God all things are possible. And I think that's what the little engine is. It's just like you, I, I can, I can, I think I can. And if you think you can and you work hard enough to do it, then you can. So does the Imagination Library have a kind of moral purpose beyond kids reading? Well, I think any time I get involved with anything, I know for myself, I'm very involved with children. I'm from a family of 12 children, as you may or may not know, and there's eight children younger than me. So, And all of the families, uh, uncles, aunts, everybody had big families. So I've always been surrounded with kids. So I just really think that anything you can do uh, to help children and get you know, books in the hands of children so they can really learn and really uh, stimulate and exercise their little minds. It just makes them more productive, wonderful people, you know, in years to come. Talk about yourself. When did you learn to read? I do not remember learning to read. That's the funniest thing. My mother always read the Bible to us. She used to to read to us. I remember learning to write and making all those letters, but it just seems like I always knew how to read. I, I know I had to learn it at some point, but I must have loved it so much at such an early age that even the memory of the learning to do it, you know, has kind of faded. So I don't, you know, how you usually remember those kinds of things, like something you've learned, but it's just like I've always known how to read and I love to read to this day. What books were there in your house growing up? There were not books in our house growing up. In fact, there were so many children in the house, we weren't allowed to bring books home from school to even do homework because uh, Mom and Daddy couldn't afford to pay for them if we chewed them up and all the little kids <laughs> peed on them or whatever the case may be or get food on them. So the main book in our home when I was a child was the Bible. And I always loved the Old Testament and all those wonderful stories that were so visual and Mama telling stories and elaborating. But I always loved fairy tales when I'd go to other people's houses to answer uh, neighbors that had books. I was always fascinated with books. Did education mean a lot? I've read that your, your dad could not read, but did education mean a lot to your parents? Well, education in the mountains like that, a lot of people don't really know how serious it is or how serious to take it. That's just what they've seen all through the years. My dad could not read nor write, and it, it was a very crippling thing for him. My daddy was such a brilliant man. He had such a wonderful thought process, and he knew he was such a great provider. He knew how to make do. But I think that when you grow up like that in the mountains where your children have to hit the fields and uh, go to work in order to help feed the rest of the family. So I know that I wasn't pushed that well that much by my parents to even, they, my daddy thought that an eighth grade education was plenty an education for a girl, <laughs> you know, and I was the first person in our family to ever graduate high school. I'd love to get you to tell the story of how the Imagination Library came. Actually, I've always been involved ever since I started getting popular in, uh, in show business. I always wanted to go home and do things, and you try to kind of pick and choose. And I always wanted to be involved with either scholarships, which we do even since the early 70s, give out scholarships. We still do to this day. And so our band uniforms or whatever. But we had done lots of different things. And then one year, we decided that we were going to start what we called the Buddy Plan. And that was where we uh, had two kids that would kind of pair up and kind of 
stir, you know, really spur each other on and stir up their excitement about learning because our dropout rate at that time in Sevier County was very, very low. I think it was like something like 34 percent. And we got the buddies and I thought, well, you know, it's not this much, it's not that much money, but we agreed to pay each study partner like $500. It was mm -hmm. just a thousand dollars for the for if the they team, graduated. if they graduated from high school and to stay in school. So they did. They all stayed in. And it was just, it wasn't about the money. It certainly wasn't that much money. It was someone paying attention, someone being interested. And then and you moved down. Then we to a lower level. Yeah. Then we moved down. We thought from that, we thought, what do we do, you know, with this? And that's when we started the Imagination Library. I thought, well, this really is you know, we need to get kids when they're young, yeah. when they're most impressionable. And, and that's why we started from where we give kids books from the time they're born once a month until they start school. Now, excuse me, but I, I remember in, in your book there was a story about how you were working with either kindergarten or first grade, and the teachers would say, well, these kids come in reading and these kids don't, and these were the poor kids and somehow poor meant dumb. I mean, could you? I, yeah. One of the things that we learned when we were doing our uh, studies with the, with the kids, well, one of the things, with, with if a child, say, for instance, was from a better family, people usually have time to spend time with that child. So we found that when kids would go to school, that some of the kids were more advanced at the same age because they had been worked with. They had someone to teach them and to to read with them. And then the other kids that where their parents maybe thought it was the teacher's job to do that, uh, or they didn't have the time to do it or having to work other jobs. And those kids started out behind those other kids. And so the ones that were just learning to read, as opposed to those that knew how to read, these little children were feeling like they were inadequate and they were made to feel dumb, that they were not as smart as. So that's when we felt like we really needed to, you know, to really work with the children. And then we also had to talk to people in the county to add in different teachers to kind of help, you know, with the kids to where all of the kids could kind of have an equal shot. So it's just really about how, how you work with children and making them, uh, you know, pay attention and to where they can really feel like they're you know, not lesser, because I understood that feeling, being brought up the way we were. Being poor made us feel like we were less people. In the book, you, you write how some people equate poor with dumb, and that must have resonated. It, it does resonate with you when people equate poor with dumb, because it's like I talk about also in the book uh, about when we used to, they used to give us clothes at Christmas or toys and things that they would give. It was almost like the welfare. And they would give us, you know, ba baskets of food and, and, and toys, whether they were used or, or whatever. And we were happy and thrilled to get the stuff. But we also knew that we were being set aside because it also meant that we were poor is why we got it. So uh, it's a fine line. We were glad to get it, but that's one of the reasons it means so much to me to make children feel important and to feel their own self-worth and not to feel inadequate. Why do you give a book from birth? I mean, a kid can't read. An infant. What's the point? Well, the point... Uh, of us giving the children books, you do know, uh, you've always heard it said, as I have, that ch children are the most impressionable uh, when they are tiny, little children, from the time they're, what, three to five years old, they say. But I think we, we give these books, that we send these books to them in their little name, with their name on it. They look forward to going to the mailbox. This is theirs. This is mine. So I am going to either learn to read it or I'm going to make somebody teach me how to read it. So it's about getting those books in their house, in their hands, and they will, because it's their property, have someone help them read it. So I think the fact that it's a gift and it's theirs with their name on it, they feel responsible not only to take care of it, but to learn to read it. Is there a message to the new parents when a book comes and the baby's a month old? <laughs> I, I, everywhere I go, ever since we started the Imagination Library, where they, the kids call me the book lady, 
parents are they thank me as much as the little kids. It makes my heart feel so good to go places and people say, Thank you for the books, Miss Dolly. You know, I love that. Or for parents separate from their children, I'm always seeing people saying thank you for the books. But I really think that uh, the parents take take a lot of pride in that. I think they appreciate it because these are not just books for poor children. These are books for all children. It started out in my home county, and now uh, we're in three countries, and we've given over, uh, I think, 47 million books out since we started. So that's a lot of children to learn to love books and to learn to read, and for the parents to also feel obligated because someone has given them a gift to get involved with their kids, and they love having it there to show the kids when they can read that this is theirs. Now, everyone knows you as the queen of country music, but you're also known as the book lady. <laughs> How did you get that title? Well, just because of all the little kids that uh, some little child, uh, the groups of them, but there was some little child that when I came in the room, everybody would say, oh, it's Dolly, it's Dolly, it's Dolly Parton or whatever. And this one little kid said, it's the book lady. And so that kind of stuck. And so all the kids now call me the book lady. And my dad was so proud of that because I told my dad I had started this in his honor and I dedicated the book to him in the front of the book. But I had told him that I had done this for him and he was so proud because uh, he lived long enough to get to, you know, to see this really doing well. And he thought that was a wonderful thing. And he was so proud for me to be called the book lady that I was doing something you know, more important than just singing. He was proud of me for everything, but he was very proud that I was doing something for the kids. Would you rank your successes? I mean, you're the queen of country music. You've sold, what, 100 million records, Dollywood, 47 million books in the Imagination Library. Where does, where does the Imagination Library rank in your own head when you look at your career? Well, it ranks more in my heart than it does in my head, I think, because it's so very, very personal to me. But it's I'm proud of everything, but I think once you get into a position to be able to do some good, whether whatever your charity may be, I think you should do that. And I just always wanted to do something to make my family proud. I wanted to do something for the folks in my home county, but loving kids as I do. But I have to tell you that the older I get, you know, we're pretty old now, the Imagination Library, we're getting on up there and we've done a lot of good. But the older I get, the more appreciative I seem to be of the book lady title. It makes me feel more like a legitimate person, not just a singer or an entertainer, but it makes me feel like I've done something good with, with my life and with my success. When you started this in 1996, did you in your wildest dreams think it could grow like this? No, I didn't. I really, really started out as a very personal thing for me, and it was uh, originally just meant for the folks in my home county because of my dad. And I thought, well, this would be a wonderful, wonderful thing for me to be able to do for the folks in Sevier County. And then uh, the, the governor at that time of Tennessee, Governor Phil Bredesen, well, he got a hold of, of this information and everybody was saying what a wonderful program this is and he got involved in it. And then it became, it was all over Tennessee. And then, of course, since then, you know, we've gone into, you know, we're in three countries and we think that's wonderful and we're just gonna to continue to grow. I'm gonna ask you quite just one question about the future. I mean, kids today, it's electronic devices that are on their smartphone or their tablet. Do you worry that your imagination library is gonna be obsolete? Well, we don't worry about it. I do believe there'll always be a lot of children's books that mm -hmm. people love to hold in their hands. But I do think with this new modern day and age, we have to be aware, and I have a wonderful group of people that's got their nose to the grindstone all the time and their eye on it, you know, making sure that we know when to do it. So I'm sure that we will eventually have, you know, whatever we need to do. We'll go wherever we need to take it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll add more music to the library and, you know, the e-books and, you know, we'll, we'll, have, uh, we'll have to do the high tech. A little too high tech for me to even talk about it, really. But I think there'll always be a place for books. I know myself, I just love the feel and the smell and the touch of books. So hopefully that'll, there'll always be a certain amount of it. But we'll roll with the tide. It's been a treat talking to you. And Thank congratulations. you. Congratulations. It's, it's uh, wonderful right. that you Thank changed you. so many lives. Well, uh, I don't day. know about that, but I'm glad well, to do my part. Well, some of those kids are now 15, 16. Oh, years. yes, they are. They're yeah. actually going to be uh, 
Yeah, I think do they're ever, doing a lot of good stuff. Do you ever hear from them? Oh, of course I do. We see them all the time. You know, a lot of kids come up and, uh, you know, talk about how, you know, how wonderful it was. And, and I'm still the book lady to them. So <laughs> what would they be now? We've got some 15-year-olds. Yeah, they're to be a senior in high school this next yeah. year. That's right. Yeah, they're about to graduate. Yeah. They've yeah. got to be 15. I think that's yeah. wonderful, yeah. 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 Well, you have more work to do. Oh, well, I do, <laughs> and I thank you.